The Business of Biotech is produced by Life Science Connect and its community of learning, solving, and sourcing resources for biopharma decision makers. If you're working on biologics process development and manufacturing challenges, you need to swing by bioprocessonline.com. If you're trying to stay ahead of the cell or gene therapy curve, visit cellandgene.com. When it's time to map out your clinical course, let clinicalleader.com help. And if optimizing outsourcing decisions is what you're after, check out outsourcepharma.com. We're Life Science Connect, and we're here to help. Nevin Charles Elam last joined me on the show back in COVID times, April 5th, 2021 to be exact. In the years since past, his company, Resolute Bio, has been quietly and diligently moving the needle on its antibody candidates in congenital hyperinsulinism and macular edema. When I think about the company, the word subtle comes to mind, not in the context of its fundraising and clinical progress, both of which have been profound, but rather in terms of its business culture and work ethic. Since we last spoke, Nevin's company has moved an early clinical program into phase two as its lead program enters phase three pivotal trials, that progress being fueled by a $130 million round this past spring. But neither Nevin nor the company have been flaunting their successes. Instead, they've been pushing forward in a fashion you might call resolute. You see what I did there, Nevin? I like that. <laughs> I'm Matt Pillar. This is the Business of Biotech. And on today's show, we're welcoming back Nevin Charles Elam for a conversation on some of the principles of steady growth that are moving a pair of completely unrelated and promising candidates forward. Nevin, it's great to see you again and welcome back. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me uh, back again. Look forward to the conversation. I don't know if subtle is the right word. I, I was thinking subtle because, you know, you're a company that strikes you like your culture and you uh, you, you strike me as not, you know, flamboyant and flashy, which is easy to find in this space. It's easy to go out there. You go to a JP Morgan show, you go to bio and you see all this pomp and circumstance and PR and you guys are good. You're steady. You've got a good PR machine, but it's never, it's never flamboyant. It's never pushy. It's just, it's, it's resolute. Do you think I'm nailing that? Do you think, do you, do you think I got that right? I mean, I think you absolutely did get that right. Um, you know, I think the culture really for our company begins with the idea of it's about a mission that you're on and a uh, path that you're walking down to hopefully develop therapeutics that will make a difference in the patient's lives. And that's first and foremost. And this is science. The science will speak for itself. You can try to be flashy. You can try to be flamboyant, but you can't back it up with good data um, and good science uh, and clinical progress. It's meaningless. And so I've always found that to be a bit futile um, and instead to build a culture around uh, non-ego focused and really about the mission. And so every individual that works in Resolute, I think absolutely adopts that ethos. And that's what makes, um, I, I think, a very productive and forward driven company. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, like I said, that's that's my reflection anyway. Uh, and I want to catch up on you, you mentioned people uh, and, and their ethos. And that's that's actually a pretty good place to start, because I want to catch up on the growth that's occurred there since we last spoke, as I said, during COVID times. Um, and and I thought, well, if we're going to talk about growth over a two and a half year period, there are plenty of places we, you know, multiple places, I should say, where we could start people, financing, science, pipeline. Um, but maybe let's start with the, the personnel additions, like over the course of the past two and a half years since we last talked, who have you added? What's the timing been? What's sort of been the, the hiring strategy as you move in particular that um, that lead candidate into, into phase three? Yeah, we've been very fortunate. Uh, over the last couple of years, I'm experiencing some clinical success and having to prepare for late stage clinical development and even thinking about the prospect of commercialization. And so with that, since we last spoke, we've more than doubled in size. Mm -hmm. um, we're about uh, 55 people today. And the growth uh, comes in a variety of areas and clinical and clinical operations, as you might imagine, as we execute um, these uh, more sophisticated late stage studies. Uh, as well as reinforcing certain core areas within the business, for example, within quality and CMC, um, two areas that are often overlooked in small biotech companies, and yet the two areas that often are the Achilles heel in looking at a drug and the potential for approval. 
So we've really reinforced the team and, and our skill set within quality and CMC, as well as expanding in clinical operations. Um, there have been a few additional GNA hires, but the other key area as well is we've begun hiring for commercial. So we've we have our first few commercial hires on board as we do think about um, since we have one program in phase three, and it's an ultra rare indication what that would look like and what that means for us as we look to to launch that into the market. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, that, that, uh, that commercial, the commercial hire, tell me a little bit more about that. Like at what, at what point in the, in the journey to, to date, did you really start thinking um, proactively about, about making that move? Well, it was really once we actually saw um, speaking specifically about our candidate RZ358, which is the antibody for uh, congenital hyperinsulinism. Uh, and this is a, a rare disease affecting children, usually right out at birth, where there is no good therapy today. And we were fortunate in a very late stage phase 2B study that read out in children that were dosed all the way down to the two years of age, where our antibody had a profound impact on actually correcting the hypoglycemia that these children experience. So at birth, they express overexpress insulin, and that creates a very dangerous hypoglycemic state, uh, particularly for the brain, uh, given that the brain uses more than half of the available glucose in the body. And not surprising, many of these children have neurological complications. Uh, so you really want to stave off or, or protect against that hypoglycemia. And our antibody was designed specifically for uh, looking for this effect to be able to correct that uh, hypoglycemic state by shifting insulin such that it resolves in a more uh, normal state, keeping it in a normal range. And what we saw, the results were fantastic. So up until those results, we had seen it in earlier proof of concept studies, but not until we saw it in a robust study over two months of dosing in children that the antibody really works with a very good safety profile that gave us confidence to recognize that we would expect to see that continue into phase three, which hopefully would then lead to an approval and if that's the case, well, you know, you can't start building commercial uh, as you finish phase three because there's no way you'll be ready uh, potentially for a drug launch. Uh, so that begins a few years in advance. And so for us, it's right now, um, given the confidence that we have in the candidate itself. Yeah. Why well, was it important to, to uh, I guess, stiffen up the quality in CMC uh, departments? I, I think, you know, for you know, every program, again, if you if you look at so many failures within drug development, it's often tied to CMC, uh, often tied to something in the manufacturing process, something in the scalability, something in repeatability. Um, there are a whole host of issues that are that can present challenges. And so having lived this life in, in different iterations, uh, definitely aware of that. And so knowing that we have a path that is very rigorous, that is um, absolutely regulated as it should be, um, making sure that each part of the drug product, drug substance, that everything is manufactured according to spec, that we do the, the releases and quality testing um, in accordance with specifications, and making sure that it's absolutely as robust as possible, um, I think eases the pathway and gives you confidence before you walk into any regulatory agency and want to present a package for approval. Yeah, very good. Um, what about uh, partnerships or collaborations and anything uh, come to fruition or kind of come together over the course of the past couple of years? You know, we've been fortunate that we've been able to raise uh, sufficient capital to be an independent uh, forward moving enterprise without the need to necessarily uh, engage in a partnership. And we really have two very distinct programs. So if I take a look at our antibody, RZ358, this is for an ultra rare indication. Uh, this is an indication where we know most of the physicians worldwide who treat these patients. Um, and as a result, we can actually prepare for and think about a commercialization strategy that we, Resolute, will lead and drive rather than a partner. Um, and so it's a, a very a very specific, it's an ultra rare indication. On the other side of the fence, we are in the middle of a phase two study for diabetic macular edema, which unfortunately is a result of the epidemic of diabetes. So and this is an, an effect um, relating to the eyes that's associated with diabetes. And in fact, is the leading cause of blindness here in the US and elsewhere in the world. 
Um, and it's a, it's a big, big disease. And so we are in the middle of a proof of concept study. After that proof of concept study, we'll evaluate our strategic options, whether we continue it into further into development, assuming that drug works, uh, or whether we would look to explore partnerships. Um, so at this stage, we haven't had the need to partner, but we will you know, continuously evaluate based on each drug candidate's profile and likely outcomes of what makes the most sense. Yeah. Yeah. Even beyond sort of um, d- development or, or licensing or whatever you want, you know, any of those sort of collaboration approaches, I would assume that especially in DME, uh, association sponsorships and or not sponsorships, but partnerships and, and uh, association with, you know, different foundations in the space and patient advocacy groups uh, might be a lot more opportunity for that in, in, in DME than uh, than in your first candidate. I would. Yeah, I think that that very well may be the case. And, you know, what we have in the DME space, I think it's important. And I think what's one of the things you've asked what's changed is that we've had some early work done in phase one, which so showed that we had a very viable potential candidate. And this candidate that we have is an oral therapy. Hmm. And today the standard of care is an injection into the eye. Mm-hmm. So what happens when a, a patient who has diabetes, uh, eventually they begin having some vision complications and it's visible on a scan. And for two, three, four years, nothing is done. And the retinal specialist will tell you that is the, the treatment option because until the disease progresses to where it is you know, becoming more problematic, the, the only thing to do is to inject into the eye. And that's a very difficult route of administration, leads to a lot of complications associated with compliance and clinical outcomes. And many of the patients don't respond even when they do take those injections into the eye. So there is this period of time where nothing can be done. And what has us particularly excited, and now we believe the retinal community throughout the US and, and elsewhere is waking up to the possibility of an oral therapy, what that would mean in the treatment paradigm. So imagine if you are experiencing visual difficulties and you do have diabetes, rather than waiting two, three, four years for that to progress, you could, if we think about in the future and the possibility of an oral therapy, put that patient on an oral treatment, which would be easy to administer and easy to take and may blunt uh, the impact of the disease, stave it off and may prevent it entirely. And so that's the paradigm shift. It's not so much a head-to-head against the injections into the eye as it is the ability to treat this uh, complicated patient population, those that suffer with diabetes, with a new therapy. And so that's what's particularly interesting about uh, this candidate drug development. Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, What other big developments over over the course of the past couple of years? Anything I missed or other... Yeah, I mean, the biggest development besides um, putting this candidate the, for DME, our oral therapy, in through phase one, where we had a, a good uh, safety profile that we uh, we observed and, and observed uh, good bioavailability, which emboldened us to do this phase two proof of concept study that we now have underway. The other big thing that happened for us was the phase two B late study that we did in children for congenital hyperinsulinism with the antibody. And the readout of that study which demonstrated, again, this substantial correction in hypoglycemia immediately led to us to raise a, a lot of capital from very quickly uh, because, you know, one of the things that's nice is when you have good clinical data, it's always been the case, uh, yeah. that should lead to the ability for markets to recognize it and for healthcare funds and other funds to realize that there's a ton of potential for that candidate and to uh, actually support it by means of investment. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and I want to dig into that a little bit on the, you know, the the power of good good data in the uh, in the financing environment. I mean, it's been a tough market for for everyone for a couple of years now. It's certainly since in the in the time since uh, since we last talked, um, you know, beyond just having ir- irrefutable data, what sort of went into your investment strategy over that course of time? I mean. Uh, you know, you you, you got to keep the lights on even when you're waiting for data. So, so I just exactly. just curious, you know, just curious what that sort of strategy package looked like as you went into prepping for and going out to secure this most recent round. Well, you know, one of the things that I've always advised companies I've worked with or companies that that I've had and is to really focus on your financing strategy, beginning with who are your anchors. Um, and so, in healthcare, I think it's absolutely fundamental 
that you have two, three, four uh, different healthcare funds that believe in your path, uh, take a long-term view, and realize that the path is never a straight one, that it will be bumpy, and to be prepared to support the company when those bumps are hit. Um, and so I think that's first and foremost what's most important. So if I go back to the COVID days uh, when we last spoke, we were you know just in the midst of, of doing some fundraising, and it was really securing those anchor tenants from the healthcare funds that would support us, and that's when we listed onto onto Nasdaq, um, and to be able to actually help us build the company in terms of providing the financial support. And so that's the, the most important thing. So that was the hardest step. Actually, during COVID days, when a lot of companies were getting a ton of money, we were a lot more systematic in our approach because we wanted to find those funds that really believed in what we were doing. Mm. And we were fortunate to be able to, to get those funds to support us. And sure enough, over the last several years, as soon as we thought, let's raise a bit more capital, the first two funds that we speak to are those that started uh, with the support at, at, uh, at the very early days. Um, and that's made the difference because with their support and with their reinforcement of the company, that's given other funds confidence to invest uh, into Resolute. So if I go back to the last round we did of 130 million, um, we did that within a matter of a couple of days because the data was clear, it was strong. Uh, the funds that had previously invested in us doubled or tripled down and other funds that have heard about the story were and knew the story were quick to participate once they saw the data themselves. Yeah. So um, with a nice way, elegant way if you can uh, to, to raise capital and to be hopefully continue to do that all the way through the lifespan of a company. Give me, uh, give me some sort of, um, I, I guess, behind the scenes perspective on, on that. Like you, when you're coming out, when you're, when you're um, relying on a, a data readout to uh, direct or, I guess, insight, fuel, uh, a, a, a funding opportunity. Um, are there, are there preconceptions or is there, is there some sort of a, a, a prior understood um, metric that your investors are, you know, more or less going to get behind even, even prior to the readout or uh, is there still, is there, is, is there some necessity for you to come back and say, okay, here's the readout. Here's what it means. Uh, here's why it's good and you should get on, uh, re remain on board. Yeah. You know, I think with respect to, to metrics and understanding before a readout actually happens, we were very uh, diligent in educating the world in terms of what would clinical success mean in this mm -hmm. patient population of young children. And so specifically, if you can correct a child's hypoglycemia, at least 25%, over the course of a 24-hour period, meaning you reduce the amount of episodes or the time they spend in hypoglycemia by at least 25% with a the therapy. That's clinically meaningful. That's impactful in terms of what that would mean for yeah. the child and for the child's family. Um, and so that was the hurdle. That was the bar we had to hit. And um, we, know we agreed with the key opinion leaders worldwide and everyone acknowledged that, that would be, if we could see at least a 25% improvement, that would be significant. And what we observed um, at the highest doses was, you know, an 80 plus percent improvement in hypoglycemia. So massive, massive correction. And that was really a surprise for us because internally we were hoping for at least, you know, 40% improvement, but to be able to see at the higher doses, which we're taking now into phase three, 75, 80% correction in hypoglycemia, in some cases uh, almost resolved hypoglycemia, um, that's, clearly demonstrable and uh, impactful. So I think when everyone saw that and everyone knew what the hurdle was, it was, you know, clearly a, uh, a, a huge success. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, I was hoping for, you know, some, some real deep, <laughs> some real deep fundraising strategy, you know, uh, it didn't, doesn't sound like it had to go, <laughs> had to go that deep. Like what, like you said, the data, data speaks for itself. You got the good data. You don't necessarily have to sell yourself. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. I agree with that. Very good. I mean, I think the selling yourself, Matt, in my opinion, really comes with selling a vision of what a drug candidate can be and why it's differentiated and why it's worth making the investment, even mm -hmm. from the beginning. I think that's the hardest part in the funding process for any company is yeah. really why this particular molecule 
What is it that makes it interesting? What is it that distinguishes it from other molecules? Why is it that we should believe that this has a good chance for being a candidate that will be successful in the clinic? That's the hardest part, I think. Once you get through that and the candidate does demonstrate success, I think the job gets a whole lot easier moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the hard work remains in the in the clinic, though. Tell us a little bit more about what sort of the the uh, pivotal phase three trial plans are for RZ three fifty eight, and and yeah, uh, we um, are just now in the midst of kicking off uh, our phase three program that we uh, we announced a few weeks ago. Uh, it's it will be in more than uh, uh, fifteen different countries uh, throughout the world, uh, which is very exciting for us. Uh, everywhere from Asia through Europe. Um, in North America, looking at uh, the Middle East as well, um, with the clinical success that we experienced, again, because it's a rare disease, there's been a ton of interest now that others have become aware of RZ358 and what its potential may mean for treating these children. Uh, there's a ton of interest in participating in phase three. So this uh, will be a, a very robust and rigorous study we're looking at over, over six months of a treatment um, duration where we will go in and hope to see exactly what we saw in phase 2B, where we administer the antibody um, and uh, expect to see a, a really good response and correction hypoglycemia. The other thing that we observed in phase two is we were dosing every other week in, in phase two. Mm -hmm. And we will have a loading dose uh, for the first few doses that will be every other week, but we're then shifting to monthly dosing which is huge because it reduces the burden for these children and their families in terms of thinking about the future pr product when it's approved, hopefully. Uh, because now you're talking about a monthly 30 minute infusion versus every other week. And that's by real world experience. So we've had an expanded access program and we've observed patients that have continued on our therapy after phase two. And we've seen that monthly dosing is, is robust uh, and works. Um, and we've also had patients in other indications. We recently announced that we collaborated with Jocelyn's at Harvard uh, with uh, an investigator to, uh, for compassionate use for a patient suffering with extreme hypoglycemia, but not associated with the congenital version, but actually related to cancer. Uh, and so there's a subset of patients with a particular type of cancer that have extreme hypoglycemia and not much can be done. And it turns out their antibody works very much the same and mm. potentially is a universal treatment for hypoglycemia. And so we've had a patient now, you know, for seven, eight months uh, who was otherwise uh, in, in fairly dire straits at, towards the end of last year, who's now been on our therapy and his dosing uh, is monthly as well. So that's given us confidence that we believe that monthly dosing will be ideal. And again, why that's really good is what it means for these patients uh, and their families in particular. Yeah. Yeah, that's that that's I mean it's always exciting to see opportunities to employ or deploy as it is your your uh, therapy in unexpected places. So fantastic news there. Um I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, you, you just said hopefully, uh hope, hopefully when when it goes to market. I want to talk a little bit more about that commercial commercialization strategy. So you you hired some uh, you know, you staffed up in that commercial area a little bit. Um what else has been sort of involved in your pre-commercialization commercialization planning? And um, I don't know, I, I'm looking for your insight as the leader into when when to, you know, really start ramping that up in earnest without getting ahead of yourself. I mean, I, I can imagine that's got to be a tough balancing act for, for a leader to make in, in your position. I think it's a fair point, Matt. You're absolutely right. Because if I think about head count growth now from where we sit as a company, and if I envision over the next two years, so we, we spoke two years ago, here we are two years later. And if I think about two years from now, I would expect nearly double the size of the company planning for success and for 80 plus percent of those hires to be in the commercial space. Um, and so it really is thinking about in a measured fashion, what is your tactical approach for commercialization? And so one of the nice things in rare disease is that you can really focus on what are the key markets that you plan to address yourself? Where is it you might use a partner or a distribution network and keeping flexibility for that mm -hmm. uh, because it's difficult to, you know, to independently address the entire world, even large pharmaceutical companies 
much bigger than Resolute, will often have distribution relationships and or partnerships in different regions. And so we've been doing a lot of that work. So that's really the work we're doing right now is the homework to understand what would be what would be the size of the organization at commercial launch. Uh, I'll use an example. If we wanted to launch in the U.S., if we wanted to launch in the major uh, Western European countries alone, we need to be prepared for that. So what is the team that would support that? And then what would be the partnering strategy potentially in other regions, as well as uh, the potential to use distributors? And then identifying who are those potential parties and what are the terms associated with those types of relationships? So all of that work you can do in advance without necessarily building up a massive team. Mm -hmm. And I think as you get closer and we, and we look towards you know 2025, uh, the first half of 2025, when we would expect to have clinical results from RZ358, and then to potentially file uh, and, and seek an approval with regulatory agencies, it's at that point that you know again the team the team gets larger. So you can't. I wouldn't do it today. I wouldn't have twenty people sitting in commercial. But um, as the clinical study progresses and moves forward, even though it'll be blinded, so we won't know the answer, we still do need to plan for success. And that's the case I think for for every company that has a program where they've demonstrated clinical efficacy and are now moving into those final stages where the last patients are being dosed and phase three is in effect wrapping up, um, you have to be a little bit ahead of yourself. Uh, it's just a question of you know, stage gating and measuring it and really understanding what's your strategy. That's the key. For emerging biotechs, scaling the process development and manufacturing of biologic molecules to clinical standards can be a challenging. However, you don't need to go it alone. Don't miss an episode of the Business of Biotech podcast, where we offer insights on regulatory, funding, and other essential topics. The pod is brought to you in collaboration with Cytiva, a global provider of technologies and services that advance and accelerate the development, manufacture, and delivery of therapeutics. Check out their resources at Cytiva.com backslash Emerging Biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A dot com backslash Emerging Biotech. Yeah, aside from like preemptive hiring, um, you know, what else can you do to avoid being the, you know, being that receiver who's turning for the end zone before the ball is in his hands and ends up dropping the ball on the turf? You know, that's a classic analogy, right? Heading for the end zone, you know, eyes on the end zone before they're on the ball. Uh, what else can you do? I mean, the, the, you know, the hiring aspect is, is certainly good advice and understood, but are there other things that you can do to sort of make sure that you're not making that uh, classic mistake? Yes, that's a that's a personal mistake since I played wide receiver as a youngster and I definitely was guilty of that. You see, you uh, thought towards you the end zone and not focusing on the ball. Yeah, um, you know, it, it, well, it's it is, a, you know, before you know, before you go on, it's it's um, I think the analogy is, it, albeit simple, uh, I, I think it's fitting because the reward is the reason for the distraction. Like you, you understood like it, and it's in, in this industry, that's a, that's a, it's a very fitting analogy. Like you are staring down, you know, staring the reward right down. It's, it's there within, within your grasp, but there's, there, there are a couple of things you got to do first. Right. So uh, I do think it's a fitting, you know, a, a fitting analogy. I'm, I'm, I'm curious what, uh, you know, what, what other sort of advice you can, you can wedge into that analogy. Well, you know, it's uh, I think one of the other, Key areas is drug supply, and that's expensive. Mm -hmm. Manufacturing drug supply to get ready for a commercial launch when you don't know the answer yet, and you think you're heading for the end zone. In this particular case, I have a little bit more confidence just given why how this drug works, meaning the mechanism of action here for this drug is a correction in hypoglycemia. And we've seen it working across different patient populations, meaning whether it's a cancer-related hypoglycemia, where it's congenital at birth with children. We've seen it working in, in patients in earlier studies um, with post-gastric uh, bypass associated hypoglycemia. Um, and so this, this drug appears to be very, very uh, impactful in terms of its ability to correct that hypoglycemia. Mm -hmm. The biggest question would be, would, be the, would there be an emergent safety signal that would be of concern? We haven't seen one to mm -hmm. date. Um, which of course is very comforting, but that's always on the radar. So given what we've seen, you know, I think then it's really a question of how much capital do you have and how careful can you be to you know, deploy the capital uh, in the right way uh, such that you don't wake up. In, the, in this case, 
heading towards the end zone, but you're running on fumes and you're out of breath and you may not get there and uh, you'll get tackled before you, before you get to the end zone. So to me, it's really in this particular instance about cash and cash management, making sure that we have sufficient capital to be able to announce results uh, and to move forward with the company um, and to be ready, ready for commercialization. So, you know, th th there are a lot of expensive areas in terms of thinking about commercialization. It's very much easier if you simply take the path, which I've done in, in previous companies, mm -hmm. where you just partner it and mm -hmm. say, where is big brother or big sister who can step in as the larger pharmaceutical company and be the be really the commercial partner in the marketing phase. Um, so uh, there's never an, an easy answer, but again, I'll, I say it goes back to strategy. You have to be very tactful in terms of, you know, think about what you can do, when you can do it, and then uh, move forward from there. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that exercise becomes all the more, um, I guess, complex when you've got, uh, another exciting and, and, and high probability probability candidate following on the heels of your lead candidate. And a lot of smaller companies, you know, will, uh, make market, I guess, adjustments to the throttles on each of those candidates. Right. And they, you know, don't, don't make it, don't, don't hold anything back. And it's very transparent. Like, you know, we're going to, we're going to back burner that because we're making good progress progress here. And they do it out of necessity. Um, Resolute has done a good job from my purview of uh, maintaining uh, a really healthy pace of progress on, on both of its, its candidates. That second uh, candidate that uh, we, that, that I mentioned uh, in macular uh, diabetic macular edema, um, totally different modality, uh, different patient population yet, progressing through, you know, phase two trials, as I said, at, at, a, at a decent clip, uh, without being sort of the forgotten, you know, the, 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 it's probably not politically correct to say a redheaded stepchild anymore, but I just said it. I was just going to say stepchild. <laughs> you threw in the redheaded. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I should have just left it at stepchild. Um, tell us a little bit about your, your management of that, mo the momentum of both those candidates simultaneously. And, and as I said, the fact that you haven't had to make these dramatic adjustments in the, in the acceleration of either. Yeah, it's a, it is definitely, it's a dance of, of, of managing multiple clinical programs. I mean, first and foremost, what I would say, even for a small company is optionality is important. And, you know, we, we've all seen and experienced and, and have lived through uh, a single product candidate and, mm -hmm. and really hoping that that product candidate finds its way to success. And sometimes it does, but when it doesn't, you know, what's left, what is resolute if there's one product candidate and it, it fails in the clinic, yeah. um, you know, the night of the living dead of biotech, which I, which I often say over the last 30 years of, of watching the space, mm -hmm. you know, companies, if they have sufficient capital can go find other assets find other companies to acquire, reinvent themselves, go from a CNS, CNS company to an oncology company, all kinds of different things. Um, but at the end of the day, it's if you can, as a small company, it's great to have optionality. And that's why we've built Resolute the way we have, because you're right, we have two very, very different programs. Mm -hmm. And here for DME, diabetic macular edema, we have a big disease, big problem, um, you know, multi-billion dollar industry that is dominated by these injections into the eye. And we have a vision, a vision of what if, what if you could take an oral pill on a daily basis and that would actually impactfully um, help address the disease. Yeah. That's huge. So it's a proof of concept study. And first things first, we have to demonstrate that. And so we'll, we're planning to announce results uh, next year in 2024. And if those results are positive, you know, we'll be doing a little tap dance. If they're not positive, well, that clearly has an impact in terms of what that means, pathway, pathway for that particular program. Um, are there other indications that we may explore? Is there business development that we would do? A lot of things we'd have to think about and we are thinking about, but, you know, we will make those adjustments when they actually happen. And if it's, if it's a success, well, clearly that just opens up, you know, the, the bigger world of possibility for Resolute. And if it's not, we still have other options, including our uh, antibody program. But also with this oral candidate, there are other disease states that may be useful and may be actually uh, good to partner. So um, it really is it, having as, as many options as possible that are manageable. 
And so for us, it's really running these, these two programs that way. And then with the cost associated with it. So we've planned for the phase two study for 402, which is our DME candidate. And we've planned for phase three, for 358, for congenital microinsulinism. Those studies are effectively paid for the capital that we have. Mm -hmm. Then it'll really be about how do we shift on the fly as those studies read out. And they read out sequentially so that everything doesn't happen at once. So every company is always evolving. And Resolute sure as heck has evolved over the last four or five years in massive ways. And we will continue to evolve. And it's just hopefully shifting into the right gear at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I even think about it in the context of um, the the patient uh, populations for each of your candidates. Uh, obviously, congenital hyperinsulinism is a very small patient population relative to um, the, the diabetic population uh, in the U.S. alone. Uh, is is there strategy in terms of the the pace of uh, of clinical progress that you to to the degree that you can affect it <laughs> to the to the degree that you can you know turn dials and and push buttons and pull levers to to accelerate um, in in terms of like the the clinical costs relative to the patient population like in hindsight if you could do it all over again would you be further along with the bigger pa patient population candidate than than the smaller population, uh, patient population candidate, or, or does that not so much matter? You know, it really doesn't so much matter. Um, and, and so far as both of the programs that we're working on, if they work, right? And mm -hmm. they, when I say if they work, I mean, they get approved. They yeah. were approved therapies. They are impactful in massive, massive ways and, and in ways that are a robust market. So while congenital hyperinsulinism, you're talking about in the major markets, about uh, about 10,000 patients. That's what we calculate. And we've yeah. done a lot of work. Part of that commercial work is analyzing the markets. And we've done a lot that's been forward moving for the for the space itself in terms of understanding the epidemiology of congenital hyperinsulinism yeah. um, and what that patient population looks like. And those that patients that would be addressable to us. It is a robust market in terms of capital um, that would, what it would mean for Resolute. Um, and so that's number one. And number two for DME, clearly that is a multi-billion dollar market as it stands. And if you had an oral therapy, we can all imagine what that would look like. Right. So for both candidates, they can stand on their own and they are standing on their own as a really strong company, if you will, thinking about them independently. So we haven't really needed to move one faster than the other. They've happened in, in the natural sequence um, that, where it's appropriate. I think the biggest question will be if the DME candidate reads out well mm -hmm. next year is what do we, what gear do we shift into then right. in terms of next steps, right? Is there another study that we run? Is it a partnership? I think that, that those will be the lingering questions uh, planning for success. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to that day. Um, what do you see other uh, emerging biopharma companies doing wrong, uh, perhaps in terms of capital management in, in similar stages, managing multiple candidates through mid clinic. Um, you know, you, you, you characterized it as a dance. Um, and there are a lot of folks who can't dance. <laughs> it requires, I mean, it requires some, some knowledge, skill, talent, grace, uh, athleticism, um, training, right? Like you're, not many people are inherently born with uh, the ability to dance. So, what are some common mistakes that you're seeing in terms of that sort of sort of cash management, cash managing the balancing act at your stage in bio? That's it's. I think it's always been been a challenge. Uh, and I'm not asking you to name names, by the way. So you can speak. Oh, freely. I would. We're, we're gonna. <laughs> Although I had five or six pop into my head, but I, I won't name names. Um, but it, it is always a challenge in terms of, of managing capital, and, and here's the reason why. I think within biotech, it's expensive first and foremost to any drug candidate to develop. Uh, it's just expensive. Everything mm -hmm. from toxicology studies to initial, um, you know, batches of material to initial clinical studies, it costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of time. So that's first and foremost. And then second, you think you have something that's very interesting, whether you observe it uh, in the lab or you observe it in early animal studies, but you really don't know what's going to happen in human beings. But there's a scientific curiosity. And I think that's that's always the case within biotech companies. And although scientists are focused on the data, what I've observed over many companies 
is that scientists also have a lot of hope. And there's a lot of expectation that, oh, this candidate really could work. So with this idea of being hopeful about a candidate, and you may have multiple candidates and a certain amount of cash, wanting to see each one progress can lead to a lot of complications and problems when it comes to cash management. Because they're the unexpected things that happen in drug development that cost a lot of money. Studies that need to be repeated, animal studies that need to be repeated. Uh, material that is not manufactured according to spec that needs to be manufactured. And all of these things that can happen and do happen in drug development really are massive setbacks in terms of cash management. So I think it's really starts with very, being very pragmatic in terms of understanding what your limitations are, what your focus is, and not straying from it and committing to it. Because once you commit to a path, um, you, do, you, you have to see that path through uh, unless you have a reason to abandon it. And if you do, you need to abandon it. And that's the other problem that I see. People will see signals and they'll say, well, but maybe if we just tweak X or Y, that'll make the difference. Well, or maybe you should actually just pause that and focus on one of the other candidates or realize that it's going to take too much capital and there's not enough time to actually bring that forward. So I think it's tough. And it's tough for all of those reasons. So I think it's in fairness to each company that has to, to go through this and to learn to dance. I think it's hard, but I think it, it really starts with pragmatism. And uh, it's, it's kind of ironic that in particular, where companies that are run by scientists, that pragmatism I've seen historically can be lost. It is ironic. It's super interesting because as you're talking, I'm sitting there thinking like, I, I know that you're a JD. Like, I know you have a legal background. I know that you weren't, you know, raised, uh, you know, you didn't come through academia as a scientist. And I also respect and admire your ability to, to learn uh, as, as much as you, as you have at the same time. Um, you probably have people in your ear all the time saying to, to, to use your words, well, what if we just tweak this? What if we just adjusted that? And these are scientists who, who know that they're not going to make necessarily make things worse if they do that. <laughs> you don't may, maybe know. Um, so the discernment, uh, that, that comes like, uh, do, uh, aside from in internal, like inputs from your scientific team and your, your science, maybe your scientific advisory board, um, are there, I guess, resources that that Nevin Charles Elam turns to to validate, like perhaps scientific advice that he's getting from people who have a uh, emotional attachment to a candidate. There, there's a there's a wordy question for you. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. That's a that's a tough question. I I think you know it. it, it two things I would say on that. One is experience. You know, I've got years of experience now, and I've seen multiple clinic, clinical candidates, some work, and many more fail. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that experience is, is informative because what it allows me to do is to ask a lot of questions. So you think you may want to focus on a different molecule and bring that forward because the first molecule didn't quite work because of its potency or whatever it may be. Well, what gives you the belief that molecule number two is going to work? And if it doesn't work, what does that mean in terms of runway for us with this particular program? Mm -hmm. And to actually ask the scientists and the physicians these types of challenging questions and to really force them to think much more like a, as a business person rather than as a scientist. So I would like to think I've been successful over the years with uh, the teams that I've worked with to be able to get individuals to think like that. And then to your point, absolutely, you know, since I am not an expert, um, in any one particular area within the scientific field is to, I, I'm very open to asking others, others that I know on the scientific advisory board, friends at other companies, you know, talking about thoughts, talking about pathways, uh, getting, getting their uh, advice, getting their input. I also ask my teams always, I say, guys, it's great. Get your little, you know, your little band of outside individuals, even beyond the scientific advisory board who can help you weigh in under confidentiality on whether you, they think this is a good path or not. Yeah. And there's sometimes resistance to that. But I think over the years, what I've noticed is when my scientists and physicians actually do that, they actually really like it because it gives them a chance even for them to vet their own ideas or concepts with others. Um, so I definitely believe in that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I, um, I asked you earlier about the, the uh, sort of financial, 
uh, management of of two candidates simultaneously. I'm also curious about, you know, as as we're talking about people and scientists and their influence on the business, I'm curious about your management of the personnel required to uh, manage two candidates at at stages they're at in clinic. Particularly, uh, uh, I'm particularly interested in that from from your perspective because, as we've ascertained, these candidates are so completely different. Um, so I'm assuming that they would require some different skill sets, different, you know, different HR horsepower behind them. So tell me, one, is that right? And two, um, it, whether right or wrong, how do you sort of negotiate the, uh, the, the human resources power behind two distinguished candidates? Yeah, I think it's a uh, fair point, Matt, that they're, they're very different programs. One is a, an antibody and the other is an oral small molecule. Start with that. Just these two different, very different drugs. Yeah. Um, so there are certain people on the team that have antibody experience and expertise for sure, um, particularly within the CMC realm, uh, as we believe that's very important to be able to have that expertise. There is also on the uh, in, in the space of diabetic macular edema, we, for example, have uh, a clinician, uh, a very talented clinician and drug developer, who really heads the program. And he's a retinal specialist. Mm -hmm. So that's very specific because we you would absolutely need that if you're going to bring forward a program for DME, someone who's been there, who's done the injections and knows the community, knows other physicians worldwide. Yeah. And so he's very critical. But then there's also the commonality of drug development and process. And so I'll, maybe I'll make an example. An example would be clinical operations. So clinical operations, you know, we have a very senior experienced team that have been through many, many studies. Uh, at different phases throughout the course of their careers. And that team can definitely function and move forward a study in DME with a CRO. At the same time, that team can also manage a CRO and manage a ultra rare program that's associated with congenital hyperinsulinism. So there's commonality. Mm. There's commonality within processes with quality and drug manufacture, whether it's a small molecule or it's a big antibody. Um, there is commonality, of course, within finance uh, and in, in other areas of, of the company. So there's, I would say, the except, there's much more the exception where you have an HR focus, like a retinal specialist who's on the team who can actually really lead uh, the DME program versus a lot of the companies, as long as you have individuals with a lot of experience. And so we're fortunate at Resolute to have a very talented, experienced team. And so um, we were able to do that and do that in a way I think it's very efficient. Yeah, yeah, very good. Um, I know we're running short on time here, Dr. Elam. I could I could keep peppering you with questions all afternoon. You just call me know. Dr. Elam. I'm not Did sure whether to be Dr. honored or to be. Oh, we'll have to edit that out. <laughs> JD, I was thinking I was thinking about the fact that <laughs> a few light edits here because Matt's tired and can't put his words together. Oh, um, that's okay. I, that, yeah. I think it's funny, really. <laughs> my, my goal, Matt, sometimes when I'm speaking and, I, and I'm speaking at conferences and I'm talking about the science and is how many people will, when I walk away or, you know, will think that I was a physician? Because if, if they do, when it happens, that means I did a really good job. You've done a good job. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, <laughs> you know, not to give short shrift to, to, uh, to, to judges and lawyers. I mean, you're in that JD. Uh, that, that, that's something to be proud of there. All your JD friends are going to be like, oh, come on. He wishes he's, 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 he's uh, aspiring to be an MD or a PhD now. Exactly. Um, <laughs> What uh, I just want to get some forward-looking thoughts, you know, without without being too forward-looking and and um, you know upsetting your your PR and IR folks. Uh, what are some of the milestones on your horizon? Uh, what, what's coming down the pike uh, for Resolute? Well, I think in the in the next uh, two years, I think about a two-year time horizon. We have a couple of big key milestones. Um, first and foremost will be this DME program. Mm -hmm. You know, the first half of next year, we're looking at Q1 of 2024 to uh, hopefully be able to announce results from our phase two proof of concept, which I think the entire world within the retinal specialty is curious. We're all curious to see how this oral uh, treatment works in patients uh, with DME. So that's the very first inflection point that'll be very, very impactful for the company. Uh, and so we're not that far, given that we're here deep into the, the days of summer of 2023. Um, and then the second 
will be the study that we're just kicking off now, our phase three study for congenital hyperinsulinism. You know, we are expecting to have um, a readout the first half of 2025 for that phase three program and planning for success as we saw in phase two, if that study is successful, well, that's huge in terms of what that means as we prepare then truly to launch, uh, to seek approval and to launch that, that drug into the market. And it'll be very, very, a lot of changes as we discussed that the company will go through. So those are the two biggest inflection points that we are actually staring at today. Um, and there may be others that we actually uh, introduce as we think about other potential um, options in terms of additional indications that we may want to explore. Um, and we'll be evaluating that as time progresses. Yeah, very good. Well, I, I'm, I'm excited for the company. As I said, I, I, I you know, sometimes I, I I get concerned when I'm when I'm talking with an exec from a company that I particularly like. I get concerned that maybe I'm being a little bit too glowing in my you know in my in my opening dialogues and that kind of thing. But Resolute's a, just a fantastic company, fantastic people, fantastic leader. I've enjoyed all the time I've spent speaking with you. Um, let me let me ask you one more question. If you were looking back on your career as a founder, CEO, uh, executive at, at, at Emerging Bio, um, what would you identify as a ca- perhaps a, a cautionary tale that you've learned uh, to share with first-time Emerging Bio founders or CEOs? Like, give, give, a, give us a sage sage piece of advice or a cautionary tale, your choice, your choice, whether you want to take one route or the other. Put you on oh, the spot with that one. Yeah, you put me on the spot. That's fair enough. That's my my job is to be put on the spot. Um, <laughs> and, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, the number one thing is, it sounds a bit like a cliche, but in this particular space, unlike say software development, uh, app development, engineering, things that can, you can solve with time and maybe mm-hmm. additional resources. This is the human body. And if you're starting and working on a company, working on a program, plan for failure, plan for things to go wrong. It's the very first thing I would say, because it's going to happen to you. And the question will be, what do you do when that actually happens? And how do you pivot? But the number one thing to prepare for is failure, because it will happen in biotech. Excellent. That's uh, both a cautionary tale and and sage advice. So you did a, a fantastic job with that. Nevin, I really it. thank you for yeah. I really appreciate. I say, it. Thanks for having me on on the show. Uh, it's good to see you again. Good to talk to you again, and appreciate your glowing support. And uh, hopefully, we'll continue to impress you as we as we march through the clinic here with our candidates. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll get you back on. It won't be two years. We're we're gonna we're gonna make sure that we get you back on before the two year two and a half years. I think Mark uh, pops up again. So, thank you for the time. Thank you. So that's Resolute Bio CEO and founder, Nevin Charles Elam. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the Business of Biotech. We're produced by Bioprocess Online and sponsored by Cytiva, whose support of new and emerging biopharma companies is on full display at cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech. If you like listening in on conversations like this one with leaders like Nevin, subscribe to the Business of Biotech, sign up for our newsletter, at bioprocessonline.com backslash B-O-B and be sure to leave us a review and let us know how we're doing. In the meantime, thanks for listening. 